We've had science for, let's say, since Newton or Copernicus, 500 years at most. We've had and look what we've done. We've, we've gone beyond the solar system with Voyager. We've walked on the moon. Um, we've, we're, we're about to go to Mars, I would think. So we're about to begin colonizing our own solar system. Um, so we've done that in 500 years. <laughs> so yeah. imagine a million years right. in the future. So I would, it's one of the arguments often used to say there aren't any civilizations out there in the galaxy. It's called the Fermi Paradox. Because if you imagine a civilization that's a million years ahead of us, they should have written their presence across the sky by now. They should, you should see them. Hmm. I mean, you'll see us. If we survive a million years into the future, actually even a few thousand years into the future, we will be exploring the galaxy. We will have spacecraft that are going to other stars. We will be doing it. So our signature will become visible, I'm sure. If you look at the surface of the moon, for example, it's covered in craters. And that was caused, they all seem to hit about the same time. And it's about 3.8 billion years ago or so. And that's called the late heavy bombardment. So we know that if you look at cratering rates on Mars and on the moon, it all seems to happen in this, not all, but a big peak around that time. And that seems to be correlated with Neptune moving outwards mm. in the solar system and into the Kuiper Belt, basically, or towards the Kuiper Belt and causing all sorts of havoc and everything comes into the inner solar system. So those things happen. And and it, but it didn't happen when life was established on the Earth. Do you ever entertain the idea that it's possible that we are the only intelligent life in the known universe? I tend to restrict myself to the galaxy. Right. So I do mm. think it's possible that at the moment there's one civilization in the Milky Way. And I think that's important, actually. And it goes back to what I was saying at the start about the uh, astronomy and cosmology being part of the framework within which you have to think. If you're looking for meaning or you're looking for how we should behave even politically you know the, that has a bearing to me i mean imagine that we're the only place where there is intelligence in this galaxy and how should we behave right should we actually notwithstanding the fact that we're tiny and fragile things and insignificant physically should we consider ourselves extremely valuable there's a theory called the grand tech theory which is so it's very hard to explain the evolution of our solar system so the, when you do computer models of solar systems, you don't tend to get four rocky planets to close to the sun and four big gas giants further out. I say this because it shows you how lucky we might be. They tend to form these big gas giants and migrate inwards towards the star. So in almost all the computer simulations, just because you've got this big gas giant orbiting in all the dust around the star, they tend to drop inwards. And it looks like Jupiter did that. So it looks like it formed and came in and came in almost to where Mars orbits today. And, and cleared out the region around Mars, actually, which is maybe the reason Mars is so small compared to the other, to, to Venus and Earth. Uh. But then Saturn was coming in as well. Well, and you see someone like the people that run SETI, and search for extraterrestrial yeah, yeah. intelligence, and they're always, like, asking for funding. And they're like, you know, we need more funding. We have to figure this out. And one day, w what if we shut down and then the signal comes? Like, that seems to me to be, like, one of the biggest, like, Hail Mary wishes. Like, hoping that you're going to find a radio signal from a galaxy far, far away that has intelligent well, life in it. for me now, a galaxy. Well, it's interesting, though. If you ask astronomers, so you say, what's the probability of other civilizations being out there? Then they will point, for example, to the new data from the Kepler Space Telescope, which tells us that there are probably around 20 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy, in the sense that they're small rocky planets in what's called a habitable zone around stars. The Goldilocks. Around main sequence stars like the Earth, <laughs> uh, like the Sun. So, so 20 billion, so maybe one in 10 stars uh, in the sky has uh, an Earth-like planet around it, potentially. So that's a lot. So you think 20 billion? Well, surely life must have arisen on, on some of those. The answer is probably yes, I suspect. I suspect we'll, well, we may find life on Mars in the next 10 years, but it'll be microbes. So the question then becomes, well, how likely is it for simple life, if it arises, to make its way into a civilization? And that's where the biologists come and, and kind of calm the astronomers down and say, well, you might think there are lots of places for life, we would agree. But on Earth, it took 3.8 billion years to go from the origin of life to a civilization, which is about a third of the age of the universe, give or take. So you had to have an unbroken, stable line of life that, 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 that um, 
that evolves in the in the right way, as it were. To so, it, first of all, it gets complex. I mean, it took the, there's a thing called the Cambrian explosion in the history of life on Earth, which it was about 550 million years ago or so, which sounds like a long time. But for three billion years before that, there was nothing that we would call complex. Single-celled organisms doing some clever stuff like photosynthesis, but not much. And then suddenly, you get a big ju jump in the oxygen content of the atmosphere on Earth, which was to do with photosynthesis and some geology in play with it. That's how the oxygen gets into the atmosphere. And then you get a big jump and you get complex life emerging. And then pretty quickly, you know, half a billion years or so, you go from complex things to, to a civilization. But even then, you think about Homo sapiens we mentioned earlier, they, they only arose 200,000 years ago. So for the, for the vast majority of the history of life on Earth, there's been nothing that could do anything clever in the sense of thinking and building spacecraft and radio telescopes. So, so there's a legitimate debate about whether the undoubted increase in we know now that there are homes for life out there in the milky way they're very common we know that but what we don't know is the probability that life will emerge in the first place and secondly the probability that will be turned into a civilization and i think that's very low so i think i think the probability if i guessed i would say the probability that life will emerge given the right conditions is very high and what one piece of evidence you could put forward to that is that it did appear to emerge on earth as soon as it could after the formation of the earth and the oceans. So you get life, but then it took a long time on earth. So you might say, well, the, you know, the probability of it doing anything intelligent and interesting are, are quite low, maybe less than one in 20 billion. <laughs> in which case, you, we end up being the only civilization in the Milky Way at the moment. If, if, if we, it's possible, you can make that argument. And my experience is academic biologists tend to be on the cautious. So, so what is a qubit? So you think about a coin which you, you would toss in the air and it can be either heads or tails. Um, so that's a, a kind of a, an intuitive picture of the world. This thing is either heads or it is tails. Now, a quantum coin um, could indeed have the property that it would be heads or tails. But the difference between quantum mechanics and classical theory is that an object like a coin, a quantum coin, can also be in what we call a superposition of heads and tails. So that means that it can be in a state where it is, let's say, if we observe the thing, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later, but it can be in a state where it could be 30% uh, heads and 70% tails, or 40% heads and 60% tails, or any combination, any mixture of heads and tails. And that is a perfectly legitimate description of the state of the configuration of this thing. Um, just to give you a sense of a, a real physical object that would behave that way, uh, particles like electrons, for example, have a property called spin, which can be up or down. It's like heads and tails. But that's the key thing, that objects like electrons can not only have definite values of some, some property, some thing that you can measure, but they can be in a, a mixture of those things. And it's not a, a probability theory in the sense that we would usually think of probability theories. So usually we'd say, well, there's a 50% a chance it's going to rain tomorrow. Um, wh why do we say that? What you see is a very clear pattern on the screen. You see sort of stripes a stripe on the screen where you get lots of electrons and then a stripe where you get very few or none and then another stripe where you get lots and then a stripe where you get very few or none and then another stripe and then very few or none. So you get this stripey pattern. That pattern is exactly the same pattern that you would get if you sent waves through the slits. Let's say water waves, any kind of waves. Uh, then it's easy to understand because what's happening then, and this follows, physicists knew this back in the 1700s, right, is that you can consider each slit as, as a source of new waves. And the waves come out, and waves have the property that they can interfere with each other. So you can get the peak of one wave arriving at the screen from one slit, and a trough of a wave arriving at the screen from another slit, and if everything's lined up correctly, the peak and the trough cancel out and you get nothing. 
So you get this property where, where something from each slit, it's very easy to understand if it's a big extended wavy thing, lines up in such a way that it cancels out. And then it could line up in such a way that it reinforces and you get a big disturbance there. And then it cancels out again and then it reinforces again. So you can imagine this stripy pattern on the screen. That's what you get with waves. The fact that you get it from particles is interesting. But here's another interesting thing. You still get that pattern if you send one particle at a time through the slits. So it is... And let me use my language carefully. I, I was going to say it is as if the electron can somehow explore both paths, just like a wave can, and then interfere with itself to control where... When we first started to point initially radio telescopes to Venus and then began to fly space probes past the planet, we found that Venus is a scorched world. This is a photograph from a Russian spacecraft called Venera 9, which landed in 1975. It found a world that it could barely survive. It only lasted for around an hour. It measured temperatures of 465 degrees Celsius on the surface. The atmospheric pressure is 90 times the atmospheric pressure on Earth. That means if you or I stood on Venus, we would be toasted and then squashed. And if that didn't do for us, we would be dissolved because the clouds of Venus rain down sulfuric acid. So far from being an idyllic, beautiful bringer of peace, the goddess of love, Venus is the closest world to hell you could imagine. When we started peering through the clouds uh, using radar, and we see a surface that is covered in volcanoes, far more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. The runaway greenhouse effect heated the planet up and destroyed it, certainly as a habitable world. So I think the lesson of Venus is that planets are not eternal. A world that was once heaven can become hell. Venus, bringer of peace, becomes a requiem for a failed planet and perhaps also a reflection on how rare places like Earth. The double slit experiment is essentially, let's say you have um, something that will emit, let, let's say electrons, so particles, electrons, electron gun that emits particles. And then you have a barrier that has two slits cut in it and a screen. So that's the setup of the experiment. So we have something that emits electrons, two slits, cut in a screen, and a, a detector, another screen uh, that the electrons will hit. So, and you, so you fire the electrons out. So what will that look like? Well, if you think of the electrons as just little particles, little bullets, let's say, that are emitted from this gun, then you would imagine that the electrons can go through one slit or the other one, depending on how they come out. And you can imagine that they might get deflected around a little bit when they go through the slits, but basically, on the screen, you would expect most of the electrons to appear opposite one or the other of the slits, with maybe a bit of a spread because they rattle around a bit when they go through. So you get lots here, lots here, and pretty much none in the middle. But that's not what you see. What you see is a very clear pattern on the screen. You see sort of stripes, a stripe on the screen where you get lots of electrons and then a stripe where you get very few or none, and then another stripe where you get lots, and then a stripe where you get very few or none, and then another stripe, and then very few or none. So you get this stripy pattern. That pattern is exactly the same pattern that you would get if you sent waves through the slits. Let's say water waves, any kind of waves. Uh, then it's easy to understand. Because what's happening then, and this follow, physicists knew this back in the 1700s, right, is that you can consider each slit as, as a source of new waves. And the waves come out, and waves have the property that they can interfere with each other. So you can get the peak of one wave arriving at the screen from one slit, and a trough of a wave arriving at the screen from another slit, and if everything's lined up correctly, the peak and the trough cancel out and you get nothing. So you get this property where, where something
from each slit, it's very easy to understand if it's a big extended wavy thing, lines up in such a way that it cancels out. And then it could line up in such a way that it reinforces and you get a big disturbance there. And then it cancels out again and then it reinforces again. So you can imagine this stripy pattern on the screen. That's what you get with waves. The fact that you get it from particles is interesting. But here's another interesting thing. You still get that pattern if you send one particle at a time through the slits. So it is... And let me use my language carefully. I, I was going to say it is as if the electron can somehow explore both paths, just like a wave can, and then interfere with itself to control where it... Like how many billion Earth-like planets did you say exist just it's, in our solar system? I mean, if, if you look at... So an astrophysical example would be a, a neutron star, which is basically a big nucleus, nuclear-dense material, the, the end point of a, of a collapsed star when it's run out of fuel. Um, if it's not too big, if it's too big, it'll turn into a black hole. So a neutron star would be uh, the, oh, what, one and a half times the mass of the sun, let's say, something like that. But it would be a radius of 10 miles. So it would easily fit in the LA metropolitan area, right? But it would have the mass of the sun or greater. So that's an atomic nucleus density. That's how you can imagine it. Something as massive as the sun compressed into something 10 miles across. And we see these things all over the... The universe, yeah. neutron stars are fascinating things. Is it possible to create a Big Bang? Or excuse me, a black hole? Is that is it possible theoretically um, to have enough power? Like if you don't have it right now with the Large Hadron Collider, is it possible that a larger machine will be created and human beings can recreate a black hole? Yes, um, it's possible. Yes. And it's possible if you have extra dimensions in the universe, right? So. The, the thing is that, so we know, gravity is a very weak force. It's by far the weakest of the four fundamental forces of nature. B billions and billions of times weaker than the other ones, which you can tell because you can pick up, you know, a phone, even though the planet, planet Earth is trying to stop me doing that, and I can just resist the pull of planet Earth. So gravity is very weak. So that gives you a clue that you can say, well, what energy, how far do I have to go back in time, if you like, in, towards the Big Bang, before it's so hot that, the, that gravity is as strong as the other forces. The strength of the forces varies, I should say, with, with, with energy. So they change. So the, and we've seen this behavior. So, so two of the forces, so-called electromagnetism, which is the most familiar one, electricity, that one, uh, and the weak nuclear force, which is one of the forces that operates in the atomic nucleus, they are the same force. They're manifestations of the same force. And we've seen this experimentally. And in fact, the Higgs boson is part of that process. And so we've seen the energies that, that they become the same force. So the idea is the other force, the strong nuclear force, if you go to higher energies and temperatures, converges. And then you have some things called grand unified theories. And then gravity makes its lethargic way back and, and unifies with them at something called the Planck energy, which is immensely short time scales after the origin of the universe, if you want to talk. Very, very hot. So it's so way in excess of anything. You, so, so if you just want to just create black holes in a lab, then the naive thing is you'd have to go to those energies and there's nowhere in the universe you'd never do it you'd have a particle accelerator the side of the observable universe and it wouldn't be big enough wow. but if you allow extra dimensions in space so you ima imagine that so we would live in a three-dimensional space and then there's time as well so we've got four dimensions if you allow there to be five or six or 13 i think the string theory that they keep changing their mind what you can do is you can arrange for that energy scale at which gravity becomes important to to to, to come up so the temperatures to drop so you can arrange you can arrange in some contrived way to get to the point where you could possibly uh, access gravity see gravity in action as it were in particle accelerators and in that case you, you would produce little black holes which would then evaporate away very quickly we think through a process called Hawking radiation and they'd be they'd be gone so, so you can conceive of a way that you could if given <laughs> so a big of a leap that there are extra dimensions in the universe and given that they're configured in the right way do it